Good morning. This is the adult Sunday school lesson from Mount Vernon Baptist Church for Sunday, September 13th. Our lesson today is taken from Genesis 126 through 225. The title of it is The Beginning of Mankind. Our application says that the student will learn that human life is created in the image of God and is unique to all creation. In terms of prayer request, we ask one more time this week, as in several straight weeks, that we be much in prayer for those who are battling the virus, all those who are infected with it, and those first responders and medical workers who are constantly working as hard as they possibly can to defeat it. I think this is a good time also for us to remember and to be in prayer for the fact that there is a virus that is much worse than the one that we currently have. And that virus has been with us for 2,000 years. That virus is the virus of sin, and that virus is 100% infection. We need to remember that. We're going to look at that today and next week. And for the virus that uh, we've had now among us for 2,000 years, we already have our vaccine. So let's think about those things as we go forward. Our lesson today is taken from portion of chapter 1 and then most of chapter 2. And the Bible reads this way, starting at chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree in which the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. And to every beast upon the earth and every fowl in the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. And God saw everything he had made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Skipping now to chapter 2, starting at verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all of the work that he had made. God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it, because that in he had rested from his work which God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth. When they were created in the day of the Lord, God made the earth and the heavens and every plant in the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Skip down, if you would, please, to verse 15. And the Lord God took the man, and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou must not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. Skipping again down to verse 21, And the Lord caused a deep sleep to come upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman, 
and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, shall cleave unto his wife, they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. May the Lord's word be blessed among us as we seek to understand it as we look at chapter 2. Now we shall see in chapter 2 the majestic wisdom of the Lord as he completes his creation work. We will dwell some on the fact that man is the only created being on earth who has a free will of choice granted by God. Even so, God's work, even in these early days, was to conclude with the purpose for the good of man. God prepared the perfect garden, created man from the dust of the earth, breathed life, meaning his soul, into him, and he became a living creature. When the Lord then brought man and placed him into the perfect garden, his divine purpose was evident. He placed Adam into the garden alone for a period of time. Such wisdom was to teach Adam that he had a need, a need for someone to be with him. And we see how God filled that need. Only God could create a way to fill that need. Here's the same lesson that we will see much later when the Lord delivers his chosen people from serving Egypt. The Lord led them into the wilderness. Why did he do that? It was to place them into a situation where only he could meet their needs. They were intended to be fully dependent upon God and no one else, including themselves to meet their needs. And their sinful grumbling, lack of trust, and strong unbelief made a journey of 11 days last 40 years, Deuteronomy 1-2. Here in chapter 2, we see man's kinship with God. We see man's worship of God, man's fellowship with God, man's service to God, and man's disloyalty to the complete authority of God. While all of Adam's needs were met, he willingly chose to reject God's one simple command. We saw the same rebellion in the Hebrews in the wilderness. We see this same rebellion still today to try and place our will and our purpose ahead of God's. This message should remain in front of our hearts and minds as we study chapter 2. In our first stop on our study journey last week, we saw the explanation of the first days of creation. All was made ready for the crown of creation, which was the beginning of mankind. That preparation was necessary to bring us to the moment of the creation of man. Out of the chaos came the cosmos, which signifies order and beauty. Out of the waters emerged the land. A scene of darkness and desolation was transformed into a scene of light, life, and eternity. At the time of that time, we saw that it was, God said it was very good. We remember in the first five days, in every case, God said that it was good. But now at the end of the sixth day, it is very good. Ten times we saw that God said, let there be. And these commands are the Ten Commandments of creation. The seal of perfection was stamped on everything God did and made. Now, as we begin to view the creation of man, we must note that the creation of man was in a far different form than his form after the fall. Adam had all that his heart could desire including a wife who was drawn by God from his own body. Here is the key to human destiny. Man is not now as God created him. God made man upright and gave him dominion. Only one command was given. Genesis is all about mankind. It's about our weakness and our failure to live in the manner commanded by the Lord. Early in our study, we see the absolute need for a Redeemer, for we could not redeem ourselves. Darkness has been changed into light by creation. Man took himself backward into that awfulness of spiritual darkness where he still lives today if he's not transformed by grace. No affections of his heart, no reasonings of his mind, 
No power of his free will can dissipate this darkness. Light comes to the sinner only by the application of God's word and his spirit. Our Old Testament teaching is Psalms 119, 130. In verses 26 through 31 of chapter 1, we see the creation of man. God's command was to engage all parts of the Godhead at this moment when he said, let us make man in our image. The us is Elohim in the Hebrew, the plural form of the word for God. Man was created perfect, fully grown, not a child. He was unique to all other parts of creation because he was made in the image of God himself. Man is not an exact copy of God, but is created in the pattern of God. This does not refer to physical resemblance, but it means he was created to possess a soul which set him apart from all other creatures. We remember that the original definition of holy is to be set apart. We also remember that when Jesus took the form of a man, he was not an exact copy of man, but he came in the likeness of human flesh, Romans 8, 3. So God made man in his own image from the dust of the ground and then breathed into him the breath of life. Only then did God place man in the perfect garden he had prepared for him. Adam was alone, and God saw that he needed a helper to complete himself and to make his life proper and full. So a woman was made from man by God to provide for his well-being and to be a partner in his life. Together, they were given the command to be fruitful and multiply to fill the earth. We're told that they are to replenish all of creation. All trees and plants were provided for food except the one tree forbidden. Even the animals were vegetarians, as was man. Man did not begin to consume the meat of animals until after the flood. We'll see that in Genesis 9. The work of God was completed by the forming of man and woman. Genesis 2.1 teaches that God ended his work after this last portion of creation. Earth, heavens, and now God's beings were here. Creation was complete. Now in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 2, God ended this work with a special day that he called a day of rest. The Hebrew word is Shabbat, and it literally means to cease or desist from further labor. God blessed this day, and he sanctified it for mankind. He assured that we would remember it by including in the Ten Commandments of the law given to Moses. It is the fourth command. On day three of creation, the plants were created, and now we see that there had not yet been rain to water them. A mist rose from the ground itself to quench the thirst of all plants and trees. Man was formed to keep and maintain God's perfect creation. He was made alive by the very breath of God, and he became a living soul. This word soul is used 757 times in the Old Testament, and in every single case it means something having life in itself. Now man's consciousness desires, thoughts, and emotions made him unique from the animals. God's plan of creation, arranged since the foundation of the world, had now been made to exist. Man began his existence in the garden God made for him eastward that was named Eden. In Hebrew, Eden means delight or pleasure. In verses 8 through 14, we see that it was a place of wonder, lush, and full, and man did not have to labor in order to eat. Two specific trees are mentioned that were placed there. One was the tree of life, to grant man life that would not end when it was eaten. This tree reappears in the end of Revelation within the new heaven and the new earth. Man was not forbidden to eat of this tree. The second tree was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eating of this tree would bring man more knowledge than God originally intended for man to have. Therefore, man was forbidden to eat of this tree. What might we say of this tree? We might say this tree was a Google tree. 
It brings far too much information and very little wisdom. Adam was forbidden by God to partake of this second tree before Eve was created. Any understanding that Eve had of this tree came from Adam. God did not speak to Eve prior to the fall. God gave his people unnumbered yeses for their food and enjoyment and nourishment in the perfect garden, and he gave them only one no. God gave man the responsibility to dress and to keep the garden. This command means to preserve it. Man had a purpose in his perfect place. We know that man fully understood language, and God spoke directly to him as he gave man his wishes for man to prosper in the provided perfection. He warned man not to eat of the forbidden tree, for if he did in that day, he would surely die. There was no misunderstanding of the command of God, just as there is none today. Here was man's first lesson concerning his morality, his responsibility, and his accountability. Adam was made to understand that God is the ultimate ruler of creation and the giver of divine law. This moment put man's love for God to its first test. The choice placed before Adam was a necessary choice. Adam would not be a moral or accountable being without the right to exercise this choice. God did not create a puppet. He created a man with free will. Adam was a free moral agent standing before God just as each and every one of us are. If God wanted obedience without choice, he would have stopped creation when he made the cattle. The implications for the disobedience of Adam were clear and profound. His choice brought him both spiritual and physical death. His spiritual death was immediate, and by his own choice, Adam stepped backward into the darkness of spiritual distance from God. That spiritual death was reinforced for us by Paul in his letter to the Ephesians. In Ephesians 2.1, Paul describes that those who are distant from God are dead in trespasses and sin. We will see in chapter 3 of Genesis the plan of God for a redeemer for sinful mankind. Paul made it very clear that those who are spiritually dead can only be made alive spiritually again, meaning quickened, by the redemption of God through his Holy Spirit touching the sinful heart. His physical death was gradual, and he immediately began aging and did indeed ultimately die. We will see in chapter 3 that God removed Adam and Eve from the garden, and they were not allowed to re-enter so that they could not eat of the tree of life and therefore live forever in a sinful <clears throat> position. We will also see in chapter 3 that Adam's first great sin was not the eating of the forbidden fruit, but it was hearkening to the voice of his wife instead of the voice of God. Read Genesis 3.17. Job clearly knew of this lesson in his own time, and he learned it well, as he did not repeat it in his time of trial. Finally, in verses 24 through 25, we see the wonderful creation by God of the institution of marriage. God had created the institution of home in the garden, and now he creates the institution of marriage. We are told God caused Adam to sleep, and God made a woman from his rib and then brought her to Adam. We should not close this part of our study without marking that both of these first arrangements by God, home and marriage, are under full-scale attack in our nation today. We all know this fact to be true. Adam knew that Eve was created from him, and he understood fully the blessing that woman is to man. Any man who does not grasp that every woman is a blessing from God violates one of God's original wishes. The next stop on our study journey, we will strike deep into the fall of man. We must never forget that the fall of our original parents was not the fault of Satan. Yes, he was the instrument of the fall, but there would have been no fall unless man and woman willingly chose it. This is the striking issue of all sin. It has no effect on any man or woman unless they willingly choose it through their own will. Man was not created like he became. He was created perfect 
immortal, innocent, and made to walk closely with God in the perfect garden that was prepared for him. Scripture is very clear on this teaching. Our last verse of our study today confirms this truth for us. Genesis 2.25 says, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Meet me next week right here to find the beginning of all original sin. I hope to see you there.